Chapter 5, Native Americans. So who are the Native Americans? The word Native American includes the greatest number of ethnic groups of any minority in the United States and currently accounts for about 2% of the population. It includes indigenous peoples, people who were native to the land before it was inhabited um, by Europeans and other settlers. It includes American Indians and Alaska Natives and total includes about 5 million people. Many foods that we eat today were introduced by Native Americans. Some examples include bean, corn, squash, cranberries, and maple syrup. So you're gonna hear especially a lot about bean, corn, and squash coming up. As far as Native American history, Native American language was mostly oral versus written, and so there's a lot of gaps in Native American history just because it wasn't written down or recorded, um, and it was passed along through storytelling and from generation to generation. But it's thought that early Native Americans crossed the Bering Strait about 20,000 to 50,000 years ago, and what the Bering Strait is was a land bridge, a historic land bridge that linked Asia to Alaska. Alaska. It's uh, currently covered by water. There are many different tribes that developed and each tribe was very, very different. And then as Europeans immigrated and colonized um, the area, which is currently the United States, they brought things like firearms, metal, and horses, and this significantly changed how Native Americans live. There's a fabulous um, book called Guns, Germ and Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond that I highly recommend you reading. In the 1930s, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was created, and this established a program of assimilation that was trying to bring Native Americans into the U.S. mainstream. It sent children off of their reservations to go to boarding schools and learn values of whites, and it caused many Native Americans to change their dress, their social structure, and occupation. But for some of them, this actually strengthened their cultural and religious beliefs. During World War II, many Native Americans joined the army or had war type employment and California had the highest number of American Indians followed by Oklahoma and Arizona. This is just with Native Americans because obviously Alaska Natives um, highly populate Alaska. This is a picture of the United States and areas in orange represent areas where there is um, over 500 or more American Indians, Eskimos, or Aleuts living there. And so the areas in orange are very highly populated. So for example, California, um, Arizona, we've got Alaska down here. This is Oklahoma. Um, those are some of the most populated regions for Native Americans. Social status and organizations. Many Native Americans have suffered due to relocations and specifically relocations to reservations. You're going to watch a few videos that include pictures of reservations on them. And what seemed to happen was the reservations were very, very barren land. Um, they were often desert-like. Things wouldn't grow. They weren't very fertile. They didn't rain a lot. And so Native Americans went from being able to enjoy just about any area they wanted so they could move around to areas where plants grew to being put on this kind of barren, fertile, infertile desert. Many um, found jobs during and after the war, but these were more kind of blue collar type jobs versus professional jobs. A current type of employment or um, economic kind of opportunity for Native Americans is with Native American Indian casinos that can be built on reservation lands. They are governed by different rules than traditional casinos. However, Native Americans still have a very high rate of poverty. And in fact, this rate of poverty is twice the average of the United States. So there is a lot of poverty, which means people at a very low socioeconomic status. Worldview. Native Americans believe in harmony and balance, and with regards to food and nature, they believe in taking only what they need and using all of what they take. So if they were to kill an animal during a hunt, for example, they would use all of the parts of that animal um, for food, for clothing, for tools, etc. 
They believed in balance and treating the earth with respect, and religion was very important to their way of life. As far as family life goes, it was a um, matriarchal society, meaning the mother was kind of the head of the household, and children and elders were very high regarded. All family was created equal, so an uncle or cousin um, didn't have a different status than a brother or sister or a mother. If you were blood related, you were family, and that was kind of the bottom line. Traditional health beliefs. I discussed a little bit their relationship with nature, but they believed in balance with nature and respect for nature. They believed illness is due to imbalance, and specifically illness could be due to supernatural, spiritual, or social imbalance. They also believed that disease or sickness was caused by different things. And some of these include um, witchcraft, possession of a spirit or soul loss, violation of taboo, evil sources, or a bad dream or desire. And this is important because if you think of how they believe, um, what they believe can cause a sickness, and then you think about traditional Western treatments, Western treatments wouldn't solve what they believe is the cause of their sickness. And so often when they go to seek health care, if they go to seek health care at all, um, treatments aren't in line with their cultural beliefs. They also have some ideas about nutrition that don't necessarily reflect uh, Western medicine, and this has to do with those beliefs on what causes sickness. So they don't believe that sickness is due to poor nutrition necessarily. They don't believe that sickness is due to infection by a virus or bacteria. Um, there's a story of an Indian who got hantavirus, um, and he didn't believe that he got hantavirus because uh, a mouse bit him, but he believed an evil spirit sent that mouse to bite him. They do have many traditional healers, medicine women. They have dreamers, which can analyze your dreams and predict the future. They have singers who can cure disease using chant and prayer ceremonies. And they almost always will try home remedies first. Different teas, different roots, um, different rubs or oils put on the body. As far as what they ate go, depending on where they live and the climate of that situation um, was the largest influence. So if they lived uh, on the coast, they ate many coastal foods. If they lived uh, inland more, they did more hunting and gathering. And the majority of their days were spent gathering and preparing foods. This was kind of their life. Native Americans who lived on the East Coast got to enjoy many fresh fruits and vegetables. Some examples are strawberries, cranberries, currants, grapes, persimmons, plums, beans, corn, and pumpkin. On the West Coast, salmon was enjoyed and fruits were enjoyed. Um, in the Plains region, buffalo was enjoyed, which we're gonna talk about coming up. And the Southwest, kind of a spicier climate, chili peppers, corn, and squash were enjoyed. Almost all populations had three staple crops, which are um, beans, corn, and squash. It is said, there's a legend of the Indian named Squanto, who you may have heard about, and it said that he actually showed white settlers how to plant and raise corn, and what he would do was take a corn kernel and put it in the head of a dead fish, and that dead fish would be buried in the ground, and the head of the fish would serve as fertilizer for the corn. Foods that were introduced by settlers. So many fruits and vegetables were introduced, and those were well accepted. Rye and wheat bread were not well accepted because traditionally Native Americans preferred to use corn as their starch or flour, so they did not like the introduction of rye and wheat. With the introduction of livestock, Native Americans were able to become more agrarian and they did not have to um, be as mobile moving from region to region because they could raise their own animals for milk and meat. With the introduction of horses, they could increase their hunting potential um, and, you know, follow animals at a faster rate, as well as with horses, soon after came the introduction of guns. In the northeastern region, fish was abundant. 
game was abundant and fruits and vegetables were abundant. This region was very heavily wooded, had coastline, had many different lakes, and was famous for some particular recipes. They enjoyed clam bake, which is kind of what it sounds like. They enjoyed a bean simmer, and this bean simmer was actually a precursor to Boston baked beans because it was made with baked beans and maple syrup. So this was um, like a Boston baked bean dish. And I know that this writing is horrible, but sorry. <clears throat> Boston baked beans. Succotash. So what is succotash? Succotash is a dish that includes corn, bean, fish, and game. And it's all together in kind of a stew. Um, and they were very well known for different recipes and cooking. In the southern region, they also enjoyed seafood as well as game, so oysters, shrimp, blue crabs, turtle, and deer. And the Indians that inhabited this area were Cherokee, Creek, and Seminole. They did farm beans, corn, and squash, and they shared some um, recipes as well as food with African culture. And this is because African slaves often lived at the very corners of reservations and at the very corners of reservations, or sorry, not reservations, plantations, um, were where Indians could come from just the lands that they were living on and interact with the African slaves. And so they shared a lot of mutual recipes. The Plains. So the Plains is what is commonly known as the Great Midwest, and the Plains was primarily known for bison. When they would hunt bison, they would use every single part of the bison. Um, they would make a soup or stew with the bison, and they would do this by actually skinning the animal, digging a hole, using the skin as kind of a bowl by placing it in that hole, and then heating up rocks and putting them in that hole with the skin, and then adding you know, vegetables and meats, et cetera. Um, and making kind of a broth. They dried buffalo or bison meat so that it could be preserved for longer periods of time and taken with them on travel. And so this is where buffalo jerky comes from or bison jerky. A lot of root vegetables grew here and were eaten year round. This is a picture of Jerusalem artichokes. And then it's thought that wild rice and bison made up about 25% of their diet. Southwestern regions were known, known for beans, chili peppers, corn, and squash. So the staple three, the beans, corn, and squash, plus the chili peppers. These were drier climates and most people farmed or hunted. There were five different varieties of corn that they primarily ate. White corn was used for a meal. Yellow corn was roasted and eaten off the kernel or the ear. Red corn was found in the south, blue corn was found in the west, and then black corn was used for specialty dishes such as hoppy bread, tortillas, pozole, or tamales. Corn was pre prepared very similar to ways that Mexican Americans prepare corn. Beans were the second most important crop next to corn, and then squash, pumpkins, cantaloupe, etc. This is a Southwest food pyramid, and you can see that it is focused for Native Americans. It does obviously include some um, processed foods as well because you see the yogurt and um, the oil, but primarily these are whole foods here. You also see that this is blue corn mash. You see a little bit of cheese, um, but you do have beans and you have squash and you have corn and you have chilies. Regional food variations. So on the Northwest coast and in Alaska, this area was quite different from the East. It was also very diverse. Um, the Pacific Northwest is very temperate. It has many hills. It rains a lot. There's lots of edible plants. It has a large growing season. However, Alaska can have a smaller growing season and can be very cold. And in fact, much of Alaska is frozen over or has a permafrost, which is a frozen layer growing under the ground and makes it very difficult to plant crops. So these regions were kind of different, whether you looked at the Pacific Northwest, which would be the coast of potentially Oregon, Washington, even Northern California um, versus Alaska. Salmon was a staple of the Northwest coast and plants made up much of the diet. 
Other things eaten in the Northwest were acorns, blackberries, mint, strawberries, and raspberries. In Alaska, so populations in Alaska were semi-nomadic, meaning they only traveled when they had to to fish and hunt. But traveling through the terrain in Alaska is quite treacherous due to weather as well as mountains as well as animal threats. They did eat a lot of sea life, whales, sea, and walrus. Seals and walrus were eaten, and primarily they would eat the fat of these animals. So the diet of traditional Alaskans was very, very high in fat and low in carbs. Many of these items were eaten raw. Um, they would eat raw fish or raw seal blubber or wal raw whale blubber, and that was okay because it was either so fresh or the temperatures were so cold that it would preserve uh, them and they would not go bad. This is a very, very old video on um, Alaska Native lifestyle and eating habits. It is from, um, it's, it's very, very good, so I do recommend you watch at least some of it. It is black and white, however, but it's very good. This is me in Alaska looking crazy um, with my son in a backpack. Anyways, when we were in Alaska, salmon is one of their main food sources, and so we did have an opportunity to catch and eat some salmon. Um, seafood was very popular. These were some crab, um, crab hollandaise, which would usually be like eggs benedict, but it was crab with hollandaise sauce on eggs. And then um, this is another picture of that. Potatoes were really common. There wasn't much spice to any of this food, and then this is a glacier that I visited. This is a menu from where I visited in Alaska. Um, and things that I saw on the menu often were reindeer. Um, I did try reindeer out of curiosity and it tasted a lot like a sausage, but you also see salmon and trout. Those would be things that are local. Um, clams from the coast. Hamburger, there are not a lot of cattle in Alaska, um, but lots of seafood is present in Alaska. I was quite disappointed to learn that reindeer are actually not native to Alaska and they actually import their reindeer. So after I had sought out and eaten this reindeer sausage thinking I was experiencing local cuisine, I actually learned I was wrong. These are some additional pictures in Alaska. It's very beautiful, a fantastic state. I recommend you go if you ever have the opportunity. Birch syrup was kind of their equivalent of maple syrup, and I saw that in many stores. They also had something called salmon berries, which were grown um, just off the side of trails and roads, and they were the color of salmon, and you could eat them, and they were relatively sweet. And then they liked to make birch cream caramel candies. This is a picture of my reindeer meatloaf. It was about as delicious as it looks, which in my opinion is quite gross. Um, again, very, very bland, but I kept trying it, hoping that it would be good. And this is my reindeer sausage and gravy. So I would say try it if you like, but um, not anything to write home about. Meal composition and cycle. So this is for Native Americans and Alaska Natives. And traditionally, it was one to two meals per day. The meals were very simple and there was little variety. They used cooking method, methods that were available to them. So it would depend on tribe and region, but roasting, steaming, drying, mashing, and baking. They had many celebrations. One of them was the Green Corn Festival, which was done for a plentiful harvest. Culture and etiquette. So food was very sacred because of their relationship with nature, but also the fact that they commonly experienced famine and hunger. And so anytime they had food, an adequate food, they were very fortunate to have that and very thankful to have that. There were different gender roles related for, to food and family life. Men were primarily responsible for hunting and women were primarily responsible for gathering, making clay pots, making cooking utensils, waterproofing baskets, and taking care of the children. Um, often the men ate first and then the women and children would eat and they believed in sharing. So they always shared with guests and it would be considered rude if somebody offered you food and you didn't take it. Tribes might cook communally, or they might have kind of a central kitchen where all the women cook together. And one thing that's interesting is they don't believe in selling foods. 
And so this is probably the reason that you don't see a lot of Native American restaurants. Um, they do sell food sometimes. For example, there's a Native American festival that's held uh, in Los Olivos down near the Chumash Casino every year, and they do sell some Native foods there, but you don't see a lot of established Native American restaurants. They believed food had many therapeutic properties and corn was an important food to them being a staple of their diet. In addition to a dietary staple, they believed that if you had cornmeal, you could sprinkle it around the bed of a sick person and that would prevent further illness from them getting more sick. They believed that corn pollen would help heart palpitations and cornmeal could be used to rub on a child child's rash. If you mixed water and corn, it could be used to relieve diarrhea, help a urinary tract infection, and even improve childbirth. <clears throat> Agave was used for wounds and actually still is today. Pumpkin was used to soothe burns. Yucca was a good laxative, etc. There were food restrictions that were specifically common during illness. Um, for example, cabbage, eggs, fish, meat, milk, onions, and organ meats should be avoided during all illness. And pregnancy, um, during pregnancy, you were supposed to avoid sweets because if a woman ate sweets while pregnant, her child would be weak. Native Americans used and found many psychotherapeutic plants and pictured is the peyote cactus that they used in many trances and hypnotic states and religious ceremonies. Unfortunately, many Native Americans were uprooted from the lands that they traditionally inhabited. You know, I talked about the lush forests of the Pacific Northwest and the East, um, but reservations are not very lush typically, and they're very arid. And so now they're not necessarily gathering foods from the land, but they're eating what's available to them. And this isn't a place where crops go easily. Oftentimes, Native Americans are getting foods from a commodity type store, which is a government subsidized store. Um, and foods might include fruit juice, peanut butter, chopped meats, eggs, evaporated or powdered milk, peas, dried beans, and instant potatoes. Um, unfortunately, many of their traditional foods were lost, and we're going to watch a video about that and how they're replaced with kind of fast foods, convenience foods, and sugars. Fry bread. Fry bread is a type of bread that's been made in the Southwest for um, actually thousands of years, and it is made from ingredients that were introduced by the Europeans, but it's often identified as being Native American. So if you are wanting to uh, do well on a test, you should know what fry bread is and that it is not something that was originally Native American but was actually introduced by the Europeans. Adaptation of food habits, instead of one or two meals a day, many people are now having three meals a day. There are more fats used and there are unhealthy fats like butter, lard, um, margarine, et cetera and fried foods are very popular. So this is a video about fried bread. Food adaptations in the US, lactose intolerance is very common, um, and so dried milk or commodity evaporated milk is used a lot. Meats, traditionally they would eat um, game meat such as bear, buffalo, deer, elk, otter, raccoon, or squirrel but now they often eat beef, lamb, or pork, and those are very popular meats. Cereals and grains, traditionally they would only have corn, but now wheat has replaced corn and there are more sweet grains and sweet grain-based products. Fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetable consumption has been affected as well, um, as well as type of fruits and vegetables they get. So often they're getting canned or frozen fruits and vegetables. And instead of having fresh potatoes, steamed potatoes, boiled potatoes, they're having potato chips. Alcoholism is quite prevalent and cause of actually a high percent of death and disease among Native American populations. Fats and oils, like I mentioned, they're being replaced by unhealthier versions of fats. Um, and sweeteners, uh, they didn't used to add any sweeteners to their foods, but now they're eating 
sugar sweetened beverages and processed foods like cookies and cakes and candies with added sugar. The only source of their sugar previously was natural foods such as maple syrup or birch syrup or honey um, or the sweetness from fruits. There are many days that are celebrated and some are listed here. I won't ask you specific details about those. Current nutrition status. So previously Native American populations did face quite a bit of malnutrition and they do still face malnutrition. However, now it's more related to overnutrition. And so we're seeing problems that are related to obesity, um, such as type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, et cetera. Alaska Native diet has changed substantially. It used to be primarily fat-based of animal fats that were freshly caught and very, very little carbs. However, now their diets are about 50% carbs, and these carbs aren't coming from fresh fruits and vegetables, but they're coming from imported, packaged, or processed foods that have low nutrient value. Many Alaska Natives have deficiencies in calcium, omega-3 fatty acids, and zinc. American Indians are also experiencing higher levels of refined carbs that are not good for them. They're eating white bread, um, white tortillas, French fries, and candy, sweetened beverages. And then they're also having a lot of high fat foods such as fried foods and beef dishes that are high in fat. Cost availability and quantity have been barriers for them as far as fruit and vegetable consumption. Their life expectancy is better than it used to be, but they still have a huge health disparity, meaning there's a big difference between the health of Native Americans and Alaska Natives compared to non-Native Americans or Alaska Natives. And so they live 4.2 years um, less or shorter time than the average American. Many mothers do not receive prenatal care. Many mothers are young and many mothers are not married. Obesity rates are very high um, within American Indians and are some of the highest actually in the world. The Havasupai Indians, uh, I believe in Arizona, have 83% obesity rates, 60% Seminoles, 61% Oklahoma Natives. And because of these high obesity rates, type 2 diabetes rates have also risen. Pima Indians have the highest rates of type 2 diabetes in the world. And we will watch a video in which you uh, will see a family, Native American family, whose father struggles with diabetes and blames a lot of the introduced foods for some of these issues. Heart disease is the leading cause of death, again, due to obesity, high fat, high processed sugar diets, and also lower rates of activity compared to traditional Native American cultures where they were moving around and hunting and gathering. Kidney disease is more common and alcoholism is more common. Alcoholism may be due to high unemployment rates, loss of kind of tribal identity, ethnic identity, and low self-esteem. Counseling Native Americans. When you're counseling Native Americans, you need to be conscious of their worldview and some of their beliefs and practices. You may have to realize that some may be low income or are kind of landlocked on a reservation where they don't have access to fresh foods or vegetables. And many of them believe that causes of sickness are not actually due to infections or nutrition, and so they might not seek medical advice. There may be language barriers, as about 50% will speak their native language in addition to English, and they prefer to be counseled in groups. So, who did we talk about today? What did we talk about? Where did they live? When and why? These are all questions for you to reflect on as you think about this chapter of Native American and Alaska Native Nutrition. All right, I will see you next time. Thank you. Let me know if there's any questions.